Hey, this is Matthew with BI Polar. In today's data culture video, we're going to take a look at one of the most important aspects of any data culture, the community where that culture takes shape. Let's take a look. In the last two videos, we looked at how IT and business in partnership can implement a model of managed self-service business intelligence, where IT does the things that IT is good at, business does the things that business is good at, and there are clear and consistent roles, responsibilities, and boundaries defined so that, ideally, everyone understands what is expected, required, and allowed for them to do. Now, before we proceed, I'd like to introduce three different terms. And please note, I'm not saying define these terms. There are lots of definitions online, and I'm not saying that my idea is the right one, but I'd like to introduce them and give you my take on these three terms. The first one is a community of practice. A community of practice, to me, is a group of professionals that come together for a given purpose, for a given practice, to build, develop, and execute on skills that deliver common good. For our purposes, the community of practice is likely to be centered around data, analytics, and business intelligence. The next term that I'd like to introduce is that of a center of excellence. Now, a center of excellence is often that group of people who are the experts inside a community or the experts inside an organization where they define the right way to do specific things uh, in the context of that organization. They provide resources, they provide guidance, they provide consultative engagements, and to one degree or another, they will execute on that work because they are the experts they're the ones who will do certain things that others may not be able to do, while at the same time building the broader skill level inside the community. That center of excellence often represents the go-to people or the go-to organization that everyone in the broader, uh, uh, the broader data culture will uh, reference as a resource where they will reach out to them when they need help, when they need guidance, when they need resources. The third term I'd like to introduce is that of a network of practice. And I don't know if this is a standard term. Uh, you know, to be fair, I haven't gone and, uh, and looked it up on, online yet. Maybe I'll do that before I'm done editing. Maybe not. But a network of practice is a term that a few of the enterprise BI customers, the enterprise Power BI customers that I work with in my day job, have introduced. They basically said that for their global enterprise organizations, where they have tens of thousands of users building and working with uh, applications and data inside of Power BI, the term center of excellence isn't adequate. For these organizations, the concept of a center of excellence, where there's this one central group of experts providing resources and guidance, it's not sufficient. For these globally distributed enterprises, they need a globally distributed network of mutually supporting centers in order to deliver the capabilities that a center of excellence typically does. Now, I don't know how common this is. This may just be a few dozen organizations in, uh, around the world that need this level of scale and this level of distribution. But the important takeaway in my mind is that as you're looking at a community of practice that contains a center of excellence, so the community is everybody and the center of excellence are those experts and the resources that they deliver, as you're looking at how these patterns and concepts apply inside your organization, realize, again, there is no one right way to do it. Look at the patterns, look at the goals, and map them to your organization's reality, both its distribution, its organization, and where it is on that gradual curve of maturity, because all of these things will determine what's best for you right now, keeping in mind that that may be different 
a month, six months, a year, or five years from now. So we've introduced some terms. What does the community actually look like? Who participates? What do they do? What's expected of them for this community to be successful and to support the goals of the data culture? The short answer is everyone who is involved in business intelligence, analytics, and data should participate as much as they can, and the value of the community comes from this critical mass of participation by having the right people contributing both their needs and their input and their value and their knowledge to support the needs of their colleagues and their peers. The community should have clear ownership and the owners should include stakeholders from each IT and business organization that will participate in the community. This is kind of key and it ties back to the executive sponsorship that we mentioned that was so critical for any successful data culture. But there should be clearly defined ownership and clearly defined goals for the community. Every community, whether it's inside an organization or BI or otherwise, every community will eventually have a crisis of identity. There will be people participating in a way that someone will ask, does this belong here? You know, is this the type of conversation that we want to be having? And unless you have those clearly defined goals up front, you will need to define them reactively when a crisis or when an emerging issue occurs. And of course, who's making these decisions? Every community needs to have a moderator or a group of moderators. If you're simply thinking, oh, well, I will you know, stand up a team site or a Slack channel uh, or a Yammer group or something along these lines, and we'll let people come and we'll see how it works, 99% of the time, this is going to fail. If you build it, they won't come, or if they do come, they will build a community that is contrary to the goals that you didn't explicitly specify up front. The role of that moderator to make sure that when someone asks a question, that there's an answer, that they're redirected to a resource. This is vital to the success of the community. You can't skimp on this, even though it does mean ongoing work and responsibility. So we've got our ownership, we've got our clearly defined goals, we've got our moderator. What happens next? The community is where people come to ask questions and to get or to provide answers. Ideally, uh, there will be a, a search feature or some manual or automated collection to define a knowledge base so that when a question is asked once, the next time someone comes with that question, there's an answer that is readily available and it's easy for people to search or otherwise discover those questions that have been asked and answered again. And of course, you can't really scale if you're relying on a small number of people or the moderator to answer all of the questions. That's a full-time job as the community grows. So success for this community means that there are more people helping more people. And to encourage this, you need to have some way to recognize and to reward that behavior. And so as an aside, in my day job, I help run a community for some Power BI customers, users of Power BI. And when someone asks a question, I or one of my fellow moderators will reach out and we will find the person who owns the answers. Oh, I know who can answer this. Send an email, send an IM, and either they will join the conversation directly and get more information, provide the information that was requested up front, and learn along the way, or my fellow moderators and I, we will get the information and relay it. But in that ideal world, we won't need to do any of this. As the community grows and matures, we see more and more people, the people with the answers, they're actively monitoring. They get value from the questions, because it tells them what's important, where people are struggling, where they should invest. And because of that, there's more and more of those answerers who are actively monitoring and providing the answers without uh, me or a, another moderator needing to reach out to them. And what do we do? What do the moderators do or the community owners do? We say thank you 
And typically this means saying thank you to them and their boss, or maybe their boss's boss. So we'll send like a monthly email saying, hey, thanks very much for your participation. Want to call out that you are our number one answerer this month. Copy the boss on CC, letting them and the people responsible for their work understand the value that they're delivering. And here I need to shout out once more to the value of the executive sponsor. Unless you have an executive sponsor, when you send that thank you email, their boss might go, why are you wasting time on this? That's not your job. Do this other thing. But with the executive sponsor, there is a shared understanding that this community and the data culture that it supports are vital, that they're important, that they're a critical factor for the organization. And that executive sponsorship adds import and adds weight to each of these interactions. And when you say thank you to someone for something that they've done on their own, they are more likely to do it again, and this creates a virtuous cycle inside the community. We've looked at some of the things that encourage and promote the behavior and the participation of those people who answer questions and provide resources. What about the other 90%? What about the people that you need for this community to be successful? You need these people to come here to ask questions and not to ask questions through their organic channels, through out-of-band email, or the ways that they've always reached out looking for help. How do you make sure that you can get that critical mass of participation, both from the people answering and the people asking those questions? A lot of it comes down to predictability and to consistency. If someone reaches out to you and says, hey, I've got this question about Power BI, or could you please help me with this data problem? If they've always reached out to you via email or calling you on the phone or sending you a chat message before the community existed, before there was a place where they should go, this is what they will continue to do. It's worked for them. They don't have a reason to change. And if you continue answering them when they reach out through these less desirable channels, they will never change their behaviors. So everyone in the community, everyone in the culture that is building and reinforcing the community needs to be consistent in saying, please go here to ask this type of question. Don't answer it. Say, go here and ask this. And what I will often do is to say, please go to this place ask me the question, and tag me to make sure that I get a notification, and then I will explain when you do this, not only will you get the answer more consistently, because I check this site every day, you won't get lost in my overfull inbox, and everyone in that community will be able to see your question and the answer, so the next person who has the same question, they will be able to get the answer there. Having this level of consistent redirection, don't ask me here, ask me here, and that's where I prioritize my answers. Over time, the number of random out-of-band emails or other, uh, other questions that you get will decrease more and more. And of course, you only get one chance to make a first impression. If someone comes in and asks a question, and there's no moderator, their, their question languishes and no one answers within a reasonable time frame, they probably won't come back. Being able to have that positive first experience in a consistent and predictable way is one of the key things to get people to come. And by having more reasons for people to come as well, this is a way to make sure that people understand it's not just a Q&A forum, it's not just chat, it's not just uh, text-based support. There are ways that you can build the community to make it more likely for more people to come regularly, even when they don't have questions. A lot of this comes down to making resources available on a regular basis. Uh, a very frequent term that I hear from customers that have implemented a successful community for BI inside their organizations is the concept of office hours or lunch and learn or uh, like showcase Tuesdays. You know, there's, there's typically a pattern of a regular weekly meeting 
where they share important updates. Look, the new version of Power BI Desktop is out, or this data source has different, uh, uh, different data in it now, so be aware that if you're getting this finance data, there's this additional dimension that we've added to the model. Or we'd like to showcase what this group in the sales organization is doing and how they've used Power BI. Having content and information that people care about and having a way to bring them into the conversation proactively rather than just when they have questions is another way to make sure that people will come to ask and to answer questions. And the key point here, the key point for all of these specific behaviors is that you want to give more contributors a reason to come and a reason to stay. One thing that we're not going to talk about in this video is what platform to use or the details of how you build a community. Because honestly, it doesn't matter. You could use Teams, you could use Yammer, you could use Slack. The most important thing is to be as close as possible to where people are already working. So if your organization, if your company lives and breathes on SharePoint and every different team has a SharePoint site and there's already a, a BI or analytics or center of excellence SharePoint site, maybe that's where your community will live. Maybe you use Teams or Slack. It really depends on the platform that your organization has already chosen and where your target audience, where the, the folks that you're trying to reach, where they're already living. For uh, companies that are using Power BI, more and more often this is going to be based on Teams. So we'll take a look in a future video uh, at some of the details about how you might choose and what content that community site might contain. But for now, I hope you've seen that by having a single common location for all key stakeholders to come together with clearly defined responsibilities for ownership and clear communication and moderation so that when people come, they find the resources that they need, the resources grow over time, and the community grows to support the goals of the data culture. I hope you enjoyed this. We'll see you next time.